Hey everybody, uh, my name is David Swallow, I work for the Passiello Group and welcome to the latest ID24 presentation. So this is the uh, 11th presentation of the day, uh, so we're almost halfway through already. Uh, for this session we have Johan Hauptmann with Accessibility is Dead, Long Live Usability. And uh, Johan is a, a, an accessibility engineer at Q42 uh, in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And Johan's going to talk about uh, why we need to see accessibility uh, for what it really is, which is usability. And he's going to tell us uh, why we need to concern ourselves less with satisfying guidelines uh, and more on creating a good user experience. And he's going to point us towards the right tools and guidance to be able to do so. Uh, so over to you, Johan. OK, welcome, everybody. Uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are, uh, from Amsterdam. Um, well, this is my talk, Accessibility is Dead, but Long Live Usability. Uh, I know it's a, quite a bold statement, but I have about, well, I think, 40, 45 minutes uh, to prove my point. So let's start right away. Uh, what is it going to be about? It's going to be about accessibility and usability and, well, the ways these two are intertwined. But it's mainly going to be about people. I'm, I'm going to share the lessons learned the past few years from people. And I'm going to talk a little about uh, how to keep the right focus. Well, a little history lesson. Uh, back in the beginning of the 90s, somewhere when the internet just became public, this was what it looked like. This is the first web browser called World Wide Web. And while it's a harsh interface, uh, you can see in the upper left corner, there's the internet. And it was quite simple back then. It was probably also very accessible because it was mainly text and not too much fluff to distract you from the task at hand. And we had about, well, one way of viewing it. Fast forward, nowadays, it looks completely different. Uh, so many options, uh, but it is very nice to the eye, very user friendly. And you also have many different ways of viewing it. Uh, but wait, there's more. You have many different ways of interacting with it. And it became much more friendly. But there is a problem. And I think the problem is that um, accessibility and usability, well, they seem to don't play nice together. Uh, and that's wrong, in my opinion. Why is it wrong? Because uh, accessibility without usability, well, is nothing. And it's also the other way around. Uh, usability without accessibility, well, it's nothing. And if we focus on building accessible products, but we forget about the usability, then we end up making products that, well, are not usable. So I think accessibility needs usability and also the other way around. And well, where does it go wrong then? Well, I don't know where, if it goes wrong in your projects or why it goes wrong in your projects, but I will share from my experience and I can tell you why it went wrong in some of the projects I did. I work at a company where we have a lot of, well, large complex projects and the way we go about projects is by using Scrum. And for those of you who don't know what Scrum is, I will give you a quick introduction. It's about working as a team with every expertise on the floor. So it's the developer, the designer, uh, the product owner, the project lead, they're all together in one room and they're all focusing on the same project. And because it's a complex project, you divide it in small tasks. So this is what a regular office wall in our office look like. It's full of these tasks, full of sticky notes and a huge backlog. And somewhere in the backlog, hidden in the backlog, there's this sticky note with the word accessibility on it. And well, it's great because it's getting some attention, but because it's on the backlog and because not everybody is convinced that it is a thing we should pick up very quickly, it ends up at the end of the backlog. And we all know at the end of the backlog, the designers have left the building. But we also know what awaits us at the end of the, the backlog and the end of the project. It's so much work and so little time so how convenient is it then that you have a checklist, a checklist that helps you, well, create accessible websites or apps. Just tick the boxes and you're accessible. Well, are you? I found out the hard way that you're not. 
Uh, what I'm about to show you is not something I'm very proud of, but I want to share with you just to, well, illustrate some things. So it's probably going to hurt your developers or your designers heart, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. The most, uh, this is a site we, uh, we did about five or six years ago, I guess, and it's for 9292, 9292 in English, and it's, it offers you a way to find public transport. So if you want to go from A to B, then uh, you open the site or the app they have and you plan your trip. So the planner here on this page is very important. But something else that's really important is, well, the actual advice you get. And for some reason, don't ask me why, we thought it was a really good idea to build this whole thing in tables. So, well, because it's a service that a lot of people use, accessibility was high on the prior priority list. So we did a lot of audits. And with every audit, it got better. And finally, we created accessible tables. Scope, IDs, headers, captions, the whole shebang was all there. The table was fully accessible, according to the people who did the audit. And then we did some tests with some users. Um, enter Arndt. Arndt is, as you may see, blind. And Arndt uses a screen reader. So with much confidence, I gave my travel advice to Arndt. I said, Arndt, you're going to like this. Well, he didn't. And why didn't he like it? Because his screen reader read out every table cell as a separate entity. So it took him ages to get from A to B on the page. Um, I asked him, well, what do you want then? He said, well, what do you want? I said, well, I want one sentence. He said, well, so do I. So eventually we build it in a different way. We build it so it would be read out as one sentence. And that's what we should have done in the first way. But then, like I said, this is ages ago, and uh, we've learned from that now. But I also thought my technical skills are not enough anymore because this is about usability. And this is not only about me, it's about the whole team that have to create a, well, a usable experience. And I thought, what am I going to do to know what, well, to save us from doing it wrong again? And well, I thought, well, let's go talk to people. Let's go talk to the actual users and ask them what, well, how they experience the internet or the apps and what we can do to, well, create better experiences. So that's what I did. And I'm going to give all these people a proper introduction, but from left to right, it's Arend, Tim, Niels, Caron, and Eva. And, well, I'm going to tell you the lessons I learned from them. And there are more than the things you can just read in blog posts or by following the guidelines. So let's start with Arend. When I met Arend, he was a student and he wanted to become a mental caretaker and he was not afraid of few source. So it saved his ass more than once on the web. When he wasn't able to find something on a page, he used few source. And as I said before, Arend is using a screen reader and also a braille reader to, um, well, to experience the web. So of course, what I learned from Arendt is write good semantic markup. What I also learned from Arendt is test everything with a keyboard. But there was one thing more, and that's not only to read and write my code, but also to listen to my code. So every now and then, I open up a screen reader, depending on what platform I'm, I'm on, and I listen to my code. Well, let's get back to the 9292, NAVE 2, NAVE 2 site. I want to illustrate something. What do you think is the most important part on this page? Well, it's the planner. So, and we can all see that. We see it in the middle. But if you open the code, it might look something like this. It's a very simplified version where you see all these links. And then you go down. You see more links, you see your form, and then down there, there's the part that 99.9% .9 of your visitors is looking for. Um, if you have a screen reader and you don't do anything about it, then the screen reader will go from uh, top to bottom. So you have to go to all these links and finally end up with the most important part on the page. So you want to consider to move it up. Or if you're, for whatever reason, not able to move it up, maybe because um, well, because the styling or so uh, forbids you to, then you create an elephant path. Uh, what's an elephant path? It's a duck saying. I'm not sure if it's also something in English, but an elephant path is actually this. It's the real life shortcuts we make. 
And this is what it looks like in code. Okay, but like I said before, uh, I listen to apps. Uh, and every now and then I listen to apps I didn't make just to learn from them. And I might advise you to listen to the photo app on um, iOS, for example. And now I will try to let you hear something. There it goes. Screenshot, portrait, April 13th, 2019. One face, crisp, well-lit image. Photo two of 35. Photo, portrait, April 13th, 2021. One face, crisp, well-lit image. So it's giving me all this extra information about the, the, the photo that I, um, well, that I wouldn't, well, I cannot see. But it's, it's telling me that it's a portrait. It's telling me something about the lighting. It's giving me all this extra information. That's beautiful. But it gets even better if you go to the navigator. Then it sounds like this. Photo chooser. Photo two of 35. Adjustable. Swipe up or down with one finger to adjust the value. So that's great, isn't it? It's You see the photo chooser at the bottom, and it's giving me, um, well, information about how I can interact with this. And that's what we call a hint. And if you ever build an app, if you ever open up Xcode, it's full of these kind of beauties. It's like, it's the hint is something you might use if you're building a UI that's, well, totally custom, not working out of the box. Then you can use a hint. So that's great. And well, you have to, to listen to it to, well, to know that this is something you need. And this is what I call hidden UX. It is, not visual, it is not obvious, but it is there, and you should take care of it. And it's also in the domain of the usability design. Um, next up, Tim. Tim is a project lead and also a developer, a developer and is uh, the founder of Hack the Planet. And I advise you to, well, of course, after Interaction Design 24, to go and check Hack the Planet. It's great. It's, um, well, he's trying to change the world, but doing what he is doing best, developing. And he also told me a funny story. Um, Tim is a climber. And at one point, he was standing at the bottom of a climbing wall uh, with his instructor. And his instructor asked him, Tim, please do the red route. So Tim went up the wall. And well, it took him ages to get to the top. And then when he was at the top of the wall and looking down, his instructor, his instructor sorry, was laughing. And he was like, well, what did you just do? You took the whole wall. You were doing the red and the green routes all together. Why did it happen? Because Tim has color blindness, and Tim cannot make any uh, distinction between red and green. So that's why I did. And in, so, of course, I learned from Tim that you shouldn't trust on color alone when you are displaying important information. I also learned from him how what a hell it is to uh, go with a tube when you're in London and you're colorblind. That's a totally different story. But I learned something else, something about um, when and where you should address accessibility in your product. In Holland, we have uh, our, our national color is orange. So you might have seen it if you ever visit the stadium with hockey or football fans. Part of the stadium is orange, especially when we win, everything is orange. We don't win a lot, but that's another <laughs> story. Um, so many Dutch brands use orange as their main color. And it's, well, it's beautiful, but it's also a problem because this is what's in the brand guide. Um, and especially look at the white text on the orange background. It's as way too low contrast. Um, and that's the thing because this has been decided long before I ever started building an app or a website. And it's in the brand guide. So it's written in stone and someone does not simply change the brand guide. Well, I know about one Dutch company that actually did. They did change the brand card after they found out that this, that this didn't work. I know about another Dutch uh, uh, company that I worked with that, well, added something to the brand guides just so it would work on apps and website. So it is possible, and but it is visual design. And it is happening way before you start developing or thinking about the user experience of your app. Next up. Niels, my good friend Niels. Uh, Niels is an entrepreneur. He has his own business. And he has a huge network, and he's an inspiration to many people. Uh, he has made it his mission to, um, well, 
make issues known in the Dutch healthcare system. And he's trying to change it by using his huge network. And just recently he got knighted because of doing so and because of being such a big inspiration. And like I said, he is a entrepreneur, so he's full of great ideas. And I asked him, well, if there's one idea that you want to make real, what is it? And let's try to make it real. So he told me about uh, adapted transport in the Netherlands. Being in a wheelchair, he is um, he needs adapted adapt transport. And he told me that about well, there there are some vehicles in the Netherlands, but 90% of the time they are doing nothing. How about if we build a service that with in these 90% you can rent these vehicles, so everybody can use them, and so we did. But of course, this service had to be used by Niels. And because Niels is spastic and, well, it's not very easy for him to use a mouse, a trackpad, or a keyboard, he uses speech recognition software. And there's a big burden on the internet for him if he has to make a reservation. He has to use a date picker. And it just doesn't work for him. So we thought of a way, how can we make a more robust and um, more forgiven date picker? And we built it. And I realized this is all in Dutch, so I translated it for you in English. And what we did was a date picker that accepts natural language. It's just an input field, and you can shout things at it, or you can type things at it. You can say, for example, I want to leave now, and then it translates it in the day today. Well, this was built on the 29th of November 2015, as you can see. Or you say, I want to leave the day after, I want to bring it back the day after tomorrow. Or you say, Monday next week. Or you say, um, somewhere in the 20th of December, and it will all accept it. So we made a more robust and more forgiven uh, date picker. And this on, does not only work for Niels, I think it works for a lot of people. But I learned something else. And that's if we look at a site like this, or a site like, this. Well, we laugh and we move on. But what if every site on the web, well, you experience every site on the web like this? And that's what, well, that's what Niels has. Every website to him causes a cognitive overload. He, uh, his brain just cannot handle too much stimuli at a time. He ex well, explained to me it's like when you first learn to drive a car. You have so many, uh, so many things to think about and what decision to make. And well, if you ever learn to drive a car, then you know what he means. So how do we solve this issue? Well, first, the bad. Look at this site. It's a new site. So many different fonts. This is a new site. So many banners and different fonts. And this is a new site. Uh, well, you spotted the difference. It's all about focus. It's about what is the one reason that your user is coming from. Well, the news, so let's put it there and skip all the rest. Niels told me that um, he preferred apps uh, above websites. And why? Because a good app does do one thing and it does it very well. That's what a good app is. So it's all about focus and it's about simplicity. And these are well-known adagios, adagiums in, for example, design, less is more, or in development. Keep it simple, stupid. And again, it's all about usability. And then I, mean, I want to introduce Caron. Caron is a trainer. And he trains people with a mental disability to become stronger, to be, present themselves in well, work whatsoever. And he does so out of experience. He has a mental disability himself. And he's a great storyteller also. And he told me some stories. And he told me also this. What is obvious to you isn't always obvious to everybody, especially not Caron. And he told me about this one story. That he told me this one story that he wanted to uh, find the garbage collection times in the municipality he, uh, he lived in, in the city he lived. So he went to the municipality website and he tried to find a schedule with the garbage collection times. And we made a movie out of that. And while I was filming him, I saw all these buttons and links and hints passing by that would point him in the right direction, and he just didn't see it. So I had to restrain myself from saying, click here, click there, because, well, we wanted to make a point. And of course, the site was full of jargon. It was a government site. And uh, the fact that he was looking for a, well, 
for something else. Or, uh, he, he was looking for a different term than was on the site. So what Caron needs is clarity. How do we achieve clarity for someone like Caron? By writing accessible texts. So when I was doing some research, I stumbled on, upon this article on AbilityNet. How do you write accessible? Well, write with a nine-year-old in mind. How, how would he or she um, read your text and would he or she understand it? And it's full of tips, but I took out three of them that well, make, uh, well, would have worked in Caron's case. Avoid jargon and abbreviations. Uh, fewer words have greater impact. And consider using audio, video, or illustration. Well, all of these were, well, non-existent on the website we visited. And if you want to know more about this, there's plenty of information if you look for writing accessible, accessible text. For example, uh, MailChimp has an uh, extensive guide. On WebAIM, you will find a lot of good examples. And we have to realize that we ourselves are full of jargon. So this is about copywriting. And it's not only Niels, uh, sorry, Caron, or other person. Uh, Caron will benefit from this. It, think about all the elderly people who have much problems with the digitalization of services. They will benefit from accessible texts or someone who is a non-native speaker of your language. And while I was filming Caron, he told me a story that made me really, really sad. He told me that his phone got hacked and he didn't know why that happened. Well, I can think of some reasons why it happened so, because maybe he got an email from someone that told him that his bank account would be blocked if he didn't fill out all his details or maybe he got a mail with an attachment saying well there's very important information about the delivery in the attachment um we all recognize these patterns but well caron he does not so i thought about the dark side of ux dark <laughs> patterns um well, just for the fun of it, I want to show you some dark patterns. Maybe all of you know, but has anybody of you ever flown, 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 flown with Ryanair? Uh, I have several times, and it is rare, very, very difficult to not end up with many extras and spending extra money on all these extras. Well, talking about the cognitive overload, this is the site when I was doing the bookings. Luckily, they changed it a while ago, but it's still full of dark patterns. For example, this one. Um, if you do not want the travel insurance, then you have to go to this drop down asking you if you want to select a country of residence. And then at the 30 something option, there is this text that's saying, don't insure me. This is a deep, deep, dark pattern. I don't want to think what happens when Caron is trying to book a flight with Ryanair. He probably would end up broke. But it's not only the, the obvious bad guys that are doing it. This is Apple on Windows. OK, I have to admit, but still, it's Apple, which I like to think of as a good guy. And maybe not such a big surprise, Amazon is using a dark pattern. Yeah, who does it? Or how about this beauty, a double negation. Uncheck if you don't want. I had to read it several times before I understood. Last but not least, Ava. Ava is a communications advisor, and she organizes a lot of meetups around accessibility in the Netherlands. And she's a lobbyist. She is lobbying for a law in Holland, in the Netherlands, that makes a sign language into an official language. And that will change a lot for people who are dependent on sign language. And as you might have guessed, she is deaf. So she, of course, told me about the importance of captions. But she also told me that captions are not only important for her, but also for us, for example, if we're in public transport or in a busy office garden, something like that. And oh, that's way too quick. She uses sign language, so she needs an interpreter. And we thought about a way, well, she, she cannot bring her interpreter every time. Of course she can, but at some point it's gonna cost her a lot of money. And we thought of ways, well, what can we do to make it easier for her? And then we thought of all these new technologies. And we thought of, well, what about, what if we um, made it possible for her to not really bring the interpreter, but bring him or her in a virtual version? 
that's where the HoloLens comes in. So here's Ava in the middle wearing a HoloLens. And here's an interpreter in a totally different room. And well, she can see the interpreter projected in the HoloLens and she's still able to see the whole room around her. But there's another thing because she is, well, I speak Dutch and she speaks Dutch, but her first language is not Dutch. Well, actually, she is a non-native speaker of the Dutch language. And remember what we said about non-native speakers? Well, we have to write accessible for them. And now I could start connecting the dots because if, well, what works for Eva might also work for Kalon. And if I keep it simple, then this will probably work out very well for Niels. And if I keep it simple and very focused, that will also work out for Arendt. And all these things will probably work out for any random group of people I pick. So it's way more than just these, these few. A small recap, what did we talk about so far? We talked about hidden UX, visual design, simplicity, clarity, copywriting, and dark patterns. And with all these stuff together, I think we have a proper team. Well, do we have a proper team? We have an engineer, UX designer, visual designer, and copywriter. I'm missing one person here, and that's our client, of course. Because somebody has to, get, has to pay the bills. Um, but how do we convince our clients that, well, this is a thing that we should think about accessibility or usability in the broadest sense of the word? That's by broadening their perspective and make it personal. That's what I think. And how do we broaden the perspective? Well, what works, of course, is numbers. I have. I had clients who have said to me, oh, that's way more than the few blind people I was thinking about. Yeah, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a big group. But what I don't like about these kind of graphs is that they put the focus on the wrong part. Because what I think is that it is not about a disability at all. Accessibility is not about disabilities. Accessibility is about specific needs. It is about being able to use my app on my website in any situation, regardless of what you can or cannot do, you should be able to use my app. So this is where it becomes personal, because when you are driving in a car, wouldn't it be nice if you could use my app without using your, well, without looking at it? This is where people will profit from, uh, well, a good voiceover. Or what to think about this? In the Netherlands, you are not allowed to look at your screen. Well, if this is if the screen makes up a big part of your car, you have a problem. So people in uh, Tesla, for example, will profit from um, well properly labeled stuff so they can use their speech recognition, or proper touch target sizes so they well they don't miss the buttons. As will this woman, or and will you will be if you have your hands full. If you have your hands full, you will um, well of course, um, benefit from proper labeling. So you can shout at your phone, turn on my lights, for example, but then you, well, you need proper labeling. If you're in a busy room or you're a bartender who's working in a, in a noisy room, uh, in a noisy room all the time, then you profit from, well, if I thought about being able to not listen to my app, so you might benefit from captions. Or when you're a non-native speaker, you well, you benefit from accessible writing. So it is about being able to use my app on my website anytime, any place, and anywhere. So everybody will benefit. And that's why I want to say, well, let's talk about usability for everyone instead of accessibility for a few. And there are a lot of game changes because there is so many happening right now. And we can have discussions about is a uh, is my uh, game on the HoloLens accessible or not? Well, probably not. But think about all the possibilities that you can have with all these new techniques. I heard Leonie Watson um, in a recent talk telling about how useful the echo is for her right now because, she, for example, her timer can read out the times for her instead of her every time touching a screen. Um, I read Molly Watts' blog about what the uh, Apple Watch is doing for her. And I just explained that we were thinking of ways how we can put the whole lens to use for people who are deaf. So let's talk about possibilities instead of disabilities. And let's talk about a good user experience for everyone. 
Now look what I found on the interactiondesign.org site. What makes a proper or a good user experience? It's, well, something has to be useful, usable, findable, credible, desirable, and well, there it is, accessible. So worrying about a good user experience is worrying about accessibility. But I think we, um, I talked about broadening your horizon, so we need new personas. And luckily for us, there are some people who already thought about it. For example, this book by Sarah Horton and Whitney Casenberry, I hope I pronounced it right. Um, it's full of great personas that you can read about and learn from. Or this slightly older, but still very relevant site, designingwithpeople.org, full of personas that you can use. And it was a big inspiration for my own small projects, Empathio, where we'll meet some familiar people. It's always on the construction, so it is now. I'm just, I'm just updating the movies, but I hope you can find something in there. And more recently, somewhere around the Global Accessibility Awareness Day, Apple released a, a huge playlist with about accessibility, with people using apps on iPhones, and well, it's great to look at. I've been spending some time trying to convince people that, well, they should focus on accessibility. And instead of telling people, you're doing it wrong, I recently found out that it's better to share all my experience and share all my mistakes so uh, everybody has, understands what it is about. Um, because we need a team. We need a proper team to uh, create the most accessible, or as I might say, the most usable experiences. We need all these people. And with all these new techniques coming up, well, there's a big question mark at the bottom because I don't know what we're going to need in the future. But we need everybody to create a usable experience for everybody. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'd like to hear from you now. That was it. <laughs> OK, okay great. great. Thanks, Thanks Johan. Johan. Very interesting, Very interesting talk. Um, I think the relationship between the usable definition of accessibility and, the, and that technical definition of accessibility is, is unclear. Um, and I know there's been little research investigating the, the relationship between websites that are you know, technically compliant um, and the actual reported usability of, of those websites. So. It's great that you know, you're exploring this and advocating this very user-centered approach um, and giving some some practical advice on how to achieve it and uh, some very uh, real, very colorful examples uh, to support it. So just checking on Twitter, um, we don't appear to have had any uh, questions just yet. Although there's been plenty of, uh, plenty of praise, plenty of positive comments and Ooh. retweets. Um, of course, if people want to continue the discussion, they uh, can get in touch yep. over Twitter okay. using the uh, hashtag ID24. Mm -hmm. So um, unless there's any other questions, check again. No. So um, I'll just say uh, thanks uh, once again uh, to Johan for a very uh, thought-provoking talk. Yeah. Well, thank and you for having me. Our uh, next talk, um, which is at 11 a.m. Uh, UTC, is um, uh, Shuetank Dixit, who will be talking about accessibility, uh, accessible smart cities. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Cool. Will do. Excellent. Thank you Thanks very again. much. Thank you all very much. Well, bye-bye. Bye-bye.